professorship. That's how it works. Yeah. So here is this professor. But they don't determine what I say. Do he comes from Denmark and works <laughs> in Stanford, and he's not a social democratic state employee. Not this. Like all the sociologists in Sweden are, according to your attack. <laughs> so even if you're financed by this reliance, whatever, you may speak freely. That's right. Especially here in Lund. Yeah. But the, the really fascinating thing about your studies, as I see it, is this ability to understand politics as a process in which um, culture and identity are very important factor in a historical perspective. So being also a good social scientist with the political economy and understanding of transformations, uh, you can place this in a, in a context. And I think you were the first one to put the, a very high qualitative analysis of international and, and for example, our understanding how how Bombay became Mumbai, and what forces that built up in Mumbai in, in the uh, 80s and the 90s to culminate in this change of name. Now we are going to move 500 kilometers to the east to a two million town called Arungabad. And here you are going to speak on how communal conflicts transform the city. And you have followed it since 1988. Okay, 25 years of history. Yeah. Okay, you're welcome. Well, Thank you very much. Thanks for, for inviting me. <laughs> uh, and it's a pleasure to be here indeed. Uh, we go back a long time. I, I think I've been to Lund on a regular basis when I was still based in Denmark and uh, Stefan has invited me several times in several contexts. So, uh, anyway, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is in fact part of a larger uh, sort of range of studies and, and, and work where I'm trying to pull together um, things I've done on urban India, so urban South Asia, um, since that time. Uh, I never really thought of myself as an urban anthropologist until at some point I realized that that's all I had ever done, uh, worked in cities. And I guess it was um, some years ago, about late 90s, I spent um, some years in Durban, South Africa, and uh, beginning to understand how those cities, especially the, the apartheid city was laid out, enabled me to, in a sense, develop a view of, of what was um, what was some of the specificities I saw in South Asia. And the other thing that happened was that I started to um, teach urban anthropology on a regular basis, and I found myself rather dissatisfied with the text we had available, the way in which we, uh, most of uh, analysis is defined of, of urban development based are still on kind of Euro-American matrix, and the whole sort of Corpus, all most of our assumptions about what happens in cities, what happens when people move to cities, how do cities shape what are the forces that really uh, move them, are based on, on Euro American uh, assumptions throughout. So, this is a part of a, uh, this talk, or some of, some of this work I'm doing, is an attempt to, um, at least at the conceptual level, return to some of these questions of what is it that, what's urban life in South Asia? like, what is it structured by, what kind of lessons can we draw from that to begin maybe to rethink uh, urban theory and uh, urban sociology as we understand it, given that the, the urban has gone south in, in, a, in a major way. I mean, all the major urban centers in the world are now a little bit south, and we don't really know how to think about them in a way that starts from that particular history, that is a colonial history, or post-colonial history. Um, so that's the kind of uh, context. The other context is I was doing work in this city, which was <coughs> at that time, the late 80s, was a smaller town, about 500,000 people. Um, and uh, uh, I then, since uh, 2012, started going back. That's very interesting to see how the city has exploded. 
in some ways, um, this project is about rethinking urban theory, but it's also about telling a story about a city that, in some ways, is not completely atypical. Of course, every city is unique, and this one is. But I think a lot of what I'm going to say, you will find resonances um, of that in virtually every sort of small town becoming a big town. Uh, and India, as is China, is full of small towns that have become big towns. Small towns you never heard about have become big towns that you should know about very soon, that you will get to know about very soon. So, when I started studying Aurangabad in the mid uh, to late 80s, um, it was really the byword for bitter and entrenched conflicts between Muslims and Hindus. It was, uh, as the name suggests, of course, a city that had a very clear uh, Muslim pedigree from having been the sort of uh, one of the southern capitals of uh, Aurangzeb during the late days of the, the Mughal Empire. <clears throat> and the city had been defined and dominated by Muslims uh, for centuries. But in the 80s, uh, the Sheikh Zena, based in Bombay, a movement I had worked on and was working on at the time, entered this region in the central Maharashtra, 500 kilometers from Bombay, as what they called themselves a Hindu fighting force. They wanted to uh, conquer the city. Which, uh, the, the demography of the city was beginning to, to change and to becoming more Hindu dominated. And they launched a sort of concerted political campaign to conquer uh, the, the political dominance in that city. So that's why I showed up there and started uh, studying what was happening, happening there. It was a, 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 a city that was, that was characterized from the late 1970s when this really began uh, until 1988-89 by constant riots. There was not just, there was no major riots. All the big riots that took place in India during that time also had uh, sort of uh, the, the incidents in uh, Aurangabad, what, what was uh, specific about it was that there was a kind of low intensity riot taking place all the time. There were uh, like clearly demarcated uh, neighborhoods and, and boundaries between Hindus, Hindu and Muslim areas, and there would be these sort of scuffles and small kinds of incidents happening all the time. And lots of people got killed, not in big spectacular ways, but in, in small, unspectacular ways. Um, then attention sort of shifted away and uh, uh, the, the riots died down after 1988. The Sheikh Sena managed to win the absolute majority in the city uh, council and uh, a majority they have kept ever since for, for more than 25 years. Um, so this, so sort of what Aurangabad then meant shifted actually interestingly in the meantime where in 2010, some of you may have heard about this, uh, there were headlines that made it all the way to the front page of the New York Times with the single largest uh, car deal uh, made by Mercedes in India where uh, a car dealership or a couple of car dealers in Aurangabad had gotten together to import in one fell swoop 150 high-end luxury Mercedes cars um, uh, and it was the largest of its kind in India. So it made a lot of headlines. It was kind of a perfect story for, for those who believe in and who in shiny in India. This was like the coming of Times. And um, the Chamber of Commerce uh, president in Maratwada, which is the historical region of which uh, Aurangabad is a, uh, is a uh, center of, he said the following. He said, well, Aurangabad has everything that you would want. It's become an economic powerhouse, but investors are still scared of coming here due to its perceived negative image, which we have decided now to change forever. So it was kind of highly concerted uh, campaign to have this uh, deal done to draw attention to the city. And indeed, it's true that the, the population had exploded, gone to almost 2 million people uh, in, by 2011. Um, and there are, it's all based on, on an industrial growth because land is cheap and there's been a, a large number of policies in place since the 70s, uh, 60s in fact, to attract uh, um, industrial investment, cheap land, reduce uh, taxes, and so on and so forth. Um, and it over time actually bore fruit, and especially in the 90s it began to bear fruit, and there are today about 2,000 registered industrial units in the city alone with a very substantial workforce. Now, um, 
What I'm going to talk about is that growth, what happened in those 25 years, uh, what the Sheep Sena and other forces did to the city, uh, uh, and, but also at the end something about how we then think about, uh, as I said, what this kind of urban growth means, how it's taking place. I have a few pictures in there. I'm not a great photographer, so I can't. Uh, there'll be a few pictures, and that's all, um, just to show you some of the more spectacular events of our uh, uh, attempted implementation of the master plan in 2012. But I'm throughout. You can you, can, you should keep in mind perhaps uh, the sort of standard received image we have of what happens in cities. The idea is that, of course, people begin to change their perception of themselves, their identities begin to transform, they no longer think of themselves. This is the standard received wisdom we have from urban sociology. People no longer think of themselves in traditional terms of caste and community and begin increasingly, especially when they're drawn into industry, to think of the terms, uh, themselves in terms of class, uh, solidarities, and so on and so forth. And some of that happened, uh, but most of it didn't happen, at least not in the way you would have expected. Okay, now, so let me just give you a little bit of background uh, to the city. So as I said, it was a city that was, uh, 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 that bore the name, still bears the name of uh, Emperor Aurangzeb. It has a very large uh, uh, architectural heritage. It has some beautiful city walls, it has as many as 52 gates to the city. It has this Bibi, Bibi Kamakbara, which is the mini Taj Mahal. Uh, which many people see when they talk, uh, pass through the city to see the Elora Santa Caves or go as pilgrims to the near, nearby pilgrim town where Shirdi Sai Baba, who is a very large uh, local uh, pilgrim, pilgrim uh, or, or large figure in, in, in South Asia, especially among poor people. Um, and there are also lots of pilgrims coming to the city to visit the, the many shrines, Sufi shrines, at Kulabad nearby where Aurangzeb's tomb is also. So, the city has all that going for it, and it's been a uh, sort of tourist center to some extent, um, but it's not really uh, had much else for, for many, many years. It um, was historically part of the uh, Hyderabad state, which is the largest of the princely states in South Asia. Uh, it was also the princely state that held out the longest uh, after 1947 and uh, independence. Uh, and it was uh, then annexed in a uh, something called the Hyderabad Police Act in 1948, which was uh, the only violent uh, uh, sort of annexation of territory that the early uh, Indian nation state engaged in. Um, it's interesting that the the, the Nizam of Hyderabad has in, in popular kind of renditions, the history books you will read if you are a school child in India, the Nizam of Hyderabad will always be represented as a form of the epitome of, of feudal um, uh, wastefulness, of uh, conservative, backward-looking uh, attitudes, uh, was supposed to be one of the richest uh, men in the world, he was supposed to be very anti-modern, very uh, uh, and quite opposed, also very suspicious of the Indian nationalist movement. Um, and so on and so forth. Uh, it turns out that on closer inspection, and historians of course have started to look into this more closely in the last few years, especially the work of Eric, Eric Beverly, who was at Stony Brook, uh, uh, has shown quite a different picture of the Nizami state. And in fact, it was a place of great uh, mixing of people, a place where lots of intellectuals, lots of architects, lots of people who uh, were devoted to sort of developing a form of a Muslim modernism, you can say, in the time before independence, uh, from the late uh, 19th century onwards. Um, they would come there, it, was, it would be a stop on a sort of, uh, 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 on a network of, of places where, where people who were dedicated to, to developing a form of modernity that was not necessarily connected to uh, British colonialism would go. So, but it, be it as it may, the Nizami state was seen as this very primitive, backward-looking, conservative place. And that was in part what made it possible for, for Sadar Patel, the first minister of the interior of independent India, to order uh, Indian troops um, to come in to, uh, 
to uh, take over the Islamic State. Now, uh, I, when I was there in the late 80s, I was surprised by how often uh, this police action was mentioned and how often also the Shiv Sena, the Hindu right, would refer to the Muslims as Razakars. And Razakars was the name of the kind of militia that the Nizam had mobilized in the dying years of his regime to defend uh, his uh, land against what he saw as an incursion from the, from the nationalist movement. Uh, and they did, uh, they committed atrocities, no doubt, but it, it was uh, surprising to me how much allied this kind of conflict was. Uh, a few years ago, uh, there was a, in fact, uh, when that police action took place, Nehru was quite disturbed by sort of informal reports he received from the area about the degree of violence. And he secretly ordered one of his trusted men, Mr. Sundalal, to go on a, a fact-finding mission. And his report, called the Sundalal Report, had been um, classified until two years ago. And it was only, it's a short report, only 35 pages. But it's quite devastating reading. Um, and he estimates that at least 40,000 people were killed, uh, mostly by, not by Indian troops, but actually by um, mostly Hindu right-wing organizations that came in and, uh, and killed people in, in mob violence and in more organized violence and so on. So these are things that run deep. So this makes, you can say, this region a little different from many other regions, and yet um, it's not something that has been subject to public knowledge or public scrutiny or has been legitimate a thing to talk about. As I go further, you'll understand why this is an important fact. Um, anyway, so uh, the city itself then got incorporated into the, the new Indian state, and various infrastructural reforms were being uh, uh, initiated. These industrial parks were being laid out, new schemes for regional development, and a new university was laid out as well. Um, but it took a long time before any of these, there was any uptake on these uh, institutional reforms. Uh, it was still at that time a predominantly Muslim town in the beginning, about 70 to 80 percent, mainly Urdu speaking, in fact many of them speaking the local dialect of Urdu, which is called Dakini, which is uh, a sort of a melodious uh, variety of, of, uh, of Urdu. Uh, so this is, uh, is, is the context in which uh, uh, these demographic movements begin to take place, where uh, uh, the city then becomes a sort of battleground, it becomes seen very much by uh, the left and the progressive forces, both of Congress but also people further to the left, as a bastion of a certain kind of feudal past, a certain kind of leftover from the Nizami past, something that we at all costs had to uh, pose. Um, and um, uh, uh, this will, in many ways, uh, show, show say, shape uh, what happens um, uh, henceforth. Uh, for. Okay, so what happened? Uh, let me just describe to you briefly some of the things that changed in the city very rapidly. L literally, you can see here um, the old city is, you can see. I don't know how clear this is to you, but the sort of center in the middle of the city chalk, more or less only a circle around here, was in the city. Oops. Um, oh, it's also there. Um, that uh, was uh, that it began in the 1950s uh, uh, when it was included into independent India. Everything that's around was added. Uh, and most of it, especially in the southern part, is called Nuwa Mangaba. It's um, a place that's full of these new colonies and new institutions and so on and so forth. That central part of the city did have older Hindu communities. I remember when I was there in the late 80s, it was still, it was because of the, at the height of these uh, battles, it was a place where uh, both communities and memories of battles from last year, the year before, 10 years before, and of course also 1948 still persisted in, in that people knew exactly 
by the foot when you passed from one area into another area. Where the Muslim Hindu division was not a mixed one or a sort of random one, as you can see in many other cities, old cities in, across North and Central India, here it actually had become very, very hammered out in precise boundaries. And they also went with a linguistic division in that the Hindus in the city would speak Marathi, and proudly so, and the people, the Muslims would speak Urdu and would not mix, and there was a strong attachment to this. And there were very few examples of people, learning, people on either side learning either of these languages. So, in effect, it became a kind of coarse Hindi that became the, 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 the language of transaction, which is not, of course, uh, uh, unheard of, but it, it was unique for its, its deep division of, of sort of language. In some ways, it conforms. Um, what happened since uh, is that the, the new city spreads around and uh, the old city becomes exactly reduced to what is the case in many, many cities or Kasper towns across North India where there has become emerging uh, over the past 20 years a sort of idea that the old Kasper town is exactly what represents all that, that we need to move away from in order to develop India. This is also where Muslims predominantly live. This is an equation of the city center, backwardness, feudalism, uh, and so on, uh, but also a kind of um, a form of patronage politics that we need to move beyond, we need to build new uh, neighborhoods, and so on. And that becomes, in this case, also predominantly a distinction between uh, Muslims and Hindus. This is what you've seen. Ahmedabad is a particularly clear example of this, but there are many, many Kanpur, many uh, towns, uh, smaller industrial towns uh, across North India have sort of similar uh, structure, something that uh, my colleagues uh, uh, Gaye and Shafalo has pointed out in a, in a book that came out some years ago, it's called Muslims in Indian Cities. Now, um, let me give you a brief account of how the city is structured before I, I get to some of the things about how it's been changed. So the fundamentals in, in Aurangabad people say that there are <coughs> Aurangabad city is structured by the three ends. The Muslims, the Marathas, which is the dominant caste among Maratha speakers, um, and the Maharas, which is the most important of the uh, form of untouchable communities, the, the Dalit uh, community from where Dr. Ambedkar came, uh, and uh, a very, very strong, and also numerically, quite a significant part of the city, about 20 to 25 percent, that uh, uh, the, the Dalit community itself. Now, uh, as I said, the, um, the, uh, the Muslim elite uh, that was a carryover from the, uh, from the time of the Nizami rule uh, stayed in power, also dominated politics in the city throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s. They dominated municipal offices, they got the jobs and so on. It was a small elite, many of them actually also Shia, uh, especially the leading families, because that was uh, the Nisami family was Shia, and they had always patronized and promoted uh, Shia interests. And many of the leading families that had been given land in the area around the city were also Shia. Uh, but then over 25 years, when I came back, uh, there was no sign, there was, there was not a single Muslim employed in the entire municipal corporation. It was completely flushed out over 25 years. And there was a sort of tragic slash amusing incident that happened when uh, the city commissioner, who was a dynamic younger man, taken over, decided to operate uh, Arangabad's image. We have to have a suave English-speaking communication manager in charge of the city. <coughs> Uh, so he hired a young, successful Muslim journalist from, uh, from the city who wanted to come home. Uh, he had worked for the Press Trust of India for many years. He came home and he, and uh, a little bit like the way appointments are being held up, as you know, by the U.S. Senate, U.S. Congress, if they don't like what's going on, in the same way that all the Shubsena people protest and said, we don't want this Muslim to work. We just flushed them all out of the municipal administration. Now we really don't want another man in. And they would only let him get this job if they forced him to learn Marathi and he was forced to give a speech in Marathi before the corporation, uh, and only then were, were they willing to give him a job, something, of course, that was meant 
and indeed functioned as a, a human leader. Um, the, um, uh, uh, it's, I should say that it's, it's uh, significant, though, uh, with, the, with the, so the sentiments among the Muslims in the city that uh, although the old elite is gone, it's the, the sense of being marginalized, the sense of being having been sidelined, the sense of being having been humiliated. It's very strong. And in the last, just last year, when the, as you may have heard, in the last uh, round of state elections, uh, a, a, a sort of more radical political party from based in Hyderabad uh, called MIM, led by the Oasis brothers, who are sort of illustrious, quite hard hitting. Uh, some people call them Muslim takalays, or the takalays, Muslim versions of this kind of hard hitting populist rhetoric. Uh, actually managed to win, some of their people managed to win quite a resounding victory in Aurangabad. So, so nothing is forgotten, everything is there, uh, still. Um, the other thing I should mention is that during uh, the 60s, and this is again something that is confusing if you don't understand the deeper context, during the 60s, um, when there were, and the late 60s and early 70s, when there were sort of many movements across the length of, and breadth of India of a more progressive variety. It was the moment of the JP Narayan rebellion or revolt against the Congress Party that, uh, that almost toppled Mrs. Gandhi uh, in the mid 70s, but also a strong left tendency. There was a, um, a coalition, in fact, of young uh, progressives, both from elected or from the Communist Party, from the Socialist Parties, but also the Dalit Panthers, which at that time had won considerable influence in Aurangabad, they managed to win a victory in the city uh, and got dominant in the city council for a brief moment. Now, one of their first acts, and uh, several elderly gentlemen who were who were part of this movement, uh, told me with pride that one of their one of their first acts was to put together a new master plan for the city. Now this is late 60s. How do you? What's the architectural thinking? What's the modernization thinking at the time among progressives in India and many other places? Well, it is knock down the old uh, garbage, get it out of the way. Let's knock some, have some big roads. Let's uh, create fresh air. All the sort of modernist thinking that was characteristic of the age, and that's exactly what happened here too. This master plan was very ambitious. It would lay out a sort of projected growth of uh, the city, and it would also mean that the vast majority of historical, um, uh, these historical uh, monuments of the city would be simply removed. There was a plan to, there was a, a system like in many old cities from the, from the Mughal era, to, uh, they had a system of nalas, that is these streams that went through the city that both provided drinking water, but also would give fresh air and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, they were, um, they had become sort of sewers more or less, and they planned to cover them all over and build parking houses on top of them and so on. So it's a typical sort of 1960s master plan. That master plan never got implemented. They were very, for them it was, it was very much about opposing the Muslim past. These were young progressives, they were not communal, they were not pro-BJP, they were, they were pro-transformation, they were pro-modernization, but for them the target was really to flush out all the remnants of the Nizami rule. Um, of course, very little happened in the end because uh, uh, they couldn't uh, implement it. Nobody had the funds to do such a very uh, uh, ambitious thing, but the master plan stayed uh, until, and did nothing until 2012, the year I came back, uh, come back to this moment. Another reason for this desire to flush out the city, to clean it up, was of course also that uh, the old city, especially uh, around the old markets, were seen as also uh, hotbeds of a particular kind of regressive politics. There was many of the local politicians who were elected, or people who, who meant something in the city, were sort of strongman types, uh, pelvans, that is, wrestler, Types uh, among Muslims, especially 
uh, people who were entwined with what was reputed to be underworld networks and so on. Uh, and on the Hindu side also, uh, significant traders and other people who were running their own kind of informal politics. And for many of these progressives, this was exactly everything that was wrong with the old Indian city, as it were. This is what had to be removed. So for them, the architectural solution was, in a sense, uh, the way ahead. Um, the other M I just want to talk about very briefly is that of the Mahasi former untouchables, because here we have another significant thing. I mean, keep in mind that this is a city that's been structured by residential segregation of a very deep and old kind, where people really knew exactly who was their neighbor, which area belonged to which group, something that's not unheard of in Indian cities. In fact, many of the older pre-colonial cities were structured in a way that's not so different from how your typical village would be structured in that there would be different hamlets, different areas with different caste groups, and that's exactly how <coughs> older cities grow up. And this is how Rangabad was too. So there were a large number of Maharas and many untouchables in the region because of um, the, uh, the, the, it had been a system of relatively large land holdings, and many land laborers working uh, uh, there. And um, they had moved into the city. Uh, many of them were seeking employment. They were seeking to make good on the uh, promise of uh, reservations of affirmative action. Um, and um, uh, they also, you can say the Nizami state was interesting in that the last Nizam, in fact, had, uh, had, been, had a very um, keen interest in the, in the Untouchables. He was very keenly interested in the liberation of the Untouchables, partly because he was very critical of Hinduism. And he saw the Untouchables as a very, and Ambedkar as a, a very important force that could what he saw as an impending sort of Hindu hegemony around him and this, as, as independence was, not, was coming closer. So for him, um, uh, supporting the, the, the Dalits was a, something that could serve his purposes, but also uh, serve as kind of critique of what he saw as Hindu hierarchy. He was sponsored, he sponsored in fact, gave land to the first the Dalit College in India, Millen College, which was uh, erected out here in the western part of the city, and sponsored by, by Ambedkar, who was the first chairman of uh, the Millen College board, and so on. And so it became soon a kind of a bit of a mecca for, for young Dalits who were seeking education. Uh, and it's again something that doesn't square with the sort of standard image of the Nizam as this kind of regressive, feudal. In fact, there was a very strong patronage of, of uh, these very progressive young Dalits who were seeking uh, to reform uh, Hinduism, as it were, from within. He started a, a major welfare for a reform uh, and also made a fund as early as 1932 and so on. Now, over time, <coughs> this continued. Millen College became, in fact, the training ground for many of the significant Dalit intellectuals you will hear about and you will find across India today, a lot of them are actually of a certain generation, came out of Millen College. So this became a very important place. And in, by the 70s, uh, of course, the Dalit Panthers also were very active in the city. And by the late 70s, they mounted a campaign to have the university in the city renamed as uh, after Ambedkar, as we now Ambedkar University. It was a campaign that uh, became very powerful by the late 80s and uh, provoked a, a massive backlash and very ferocious violence both from the police and from the dominant caste groups, which are not Brahmin, but actually Marathas in the region. Uh, with lots of people killed, uh, it's disputed how many exactly were killed, but we're talking about certainly in the, in the region of uh, between 100 and 150 people were killed, many more wounded, many more homes, just in and around, around about that. But then the violence spread throughout the region, uh, and there were sort of just violence, random, not that anti dalit violence is, is unknown in this part of uh, India, but at that time there were just many, many unprovoked uh, attacks on Dalit uh, villages and hamlets across the whole region. 
So this became a sort of flashpoint for further Dalit mobilization, for the sort of harnessing of this demand for the renaming of the university, which then eventually happened in 1990, so many years later. Uh, but what the most important effect of this was, in fact, that this was the beginning of the Shiv Sena, the Hindu right coming, uh, the beginning to mobilize. One would think that they would start mobilizing against a sort of perceived Muslim threat, but actually what they mobilized against was this uh, perceived threat from, from Dalits. Uh, and this is, when I did work then in the late 80s and early 90s, this is many of the young men who were active, who set up, so you say that they were all of them quoting that this was the moment where we had to defend Hinduism against the onslaught, as far as they could see, combined onslaught from Dalits and Muslims. Interestingly, this has come together again in this, as I said, the victory of the Uwezi of the MIM last year on a platform that openly advocated alliance between Dalits and Muslims. So, uh, in a sense, the worst nightmare of Sri Sena is coming to be true. Um, now, over time, this uh, community only grew and grew, uh, and it's uh, probably one of the most outside of Bombay, uh, around about is one of the more, and not quite one of the more important centers of Dalit activism, and the cultural life, uh, Dalit education, and so on. The, the movement was called Namanta Andolan, the renaming movement, and it has just had a, 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 a monument erected, uh, not in the city of Aurangabad, which was the epicenter, but somewhere else. Uh, so this is the second M, you can say, in the city, uh, which really was a defining thing. It, 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 again, it's not uh, perhaps unheard of in other cities, but there's a particular kind of deep history of all these uh, groupings for a long time, also uh, jockeying for space, uh, and of course, when it comes to uh, Dalit uh, neighborhoods, there's been also a very careful uh, uh, attention paid from, especially from caste Hindus, not to live in neighborhoods too close to, to Dalit colonies. So the spatial separation along community lines has a very deep and long history, something that has not exactly changed in the last, uh, in the last uh, uh, 25 years, as the city has grown into an industrial park. I'll come back to this. What is interesting is, of course, as the university was renamed, it also becomes a symbolic magnet for Dalit students from all over India. So today, there is about in the sort of uh, Marathwada University, what was the old Marathwada University, today called uh, B.R. Ambedkar University, there's about approximately different colleges across the region, about 100,000 students enrolled, out of which professors at the university estimate about half are Dalits, not just from the local region, but from all over the country. So uh, this really has become a hub of Dalit activity. Okay. So let me just briefly, uh, the last M is the Marathas. The region is known as uh, 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 famous and even named, uh, Maragwada is the region is named after Marathas. It's a place that uh, lots of uh, mythical tales of bravery and heroism of the specific hardy and military qualities of Marathas going back to the days of Shivaji, uh, the, the, the Hindu king. Uh, in this uh, region, uh, and of course, the long history of conflicts with Muslims. So when when the Sri Sena moved into the city in the late 80s and took, tried to take possession of its political uh, landscape, uh, it was playing constantly on all these deep themes. History was there all the time. It was about the 1948 conflict. It was also about the conflicts between Shivaji and Aurangzeb. It was also replaying. The, the fact that Aurang steps, uh, that Shivaji's son, Sambhaji, had been killed uh, in a clash uh, and had been executed by one of Aurang Seb's commanders. So they, one of the first things they did uh, in the early 90s, when after coming to power, was to suggest that the city should have a new name, much like they also promoted the name change, a sort of vernacular uh, name for for what they saw as a proper vernacular, that is a Hindu name for 
called city, and they suggested it should be called Sambaji Nagar. Uh, much sort of uncharacteristically, uncharac perhaps, uh, what the city then decided, or the state, the uh, state government decided, was to put together a commission of historians who, uh, after six to eight months' work, uh, concluded that this was no, there was no historical basis for calling it Sambaji in Nagar, uh, but it, because the city, in fact, had been founded not by Aurangzeb, but by a famous uh, commander of the Deccan called Malik Amba. Now, Malik Amba was actually an Ethiopian slave who had been, along with many other so slave soldiers, for, uh, slaves from East Africa, had been uh, uh, taken to India as troops. So many of them had worked for the Sultan of Ahmednagar nearby. Um, and some of them even ascended to become rulers of, of some of these smaller uh, kingdoms in Western India at the time. This is before Sivaji. They also said that Malik Amba had been, he had designed the city. He was probably also the man who had developed more, more or less all the military techniques that Sivaji later used and made famous. So, uh, in a sense, there was nothing original, neither about Shivaji or somebody. So, as you can imagine, people were very furious with this, and the suggestion of calling it Amba Nagar uh, after Malik Amba was roundly rejected, not just by the Sri Sena, but also by many of the conservative uh, Muslims for whom maintaining a Persian link and a link to uh, uh, the Persian dynasty, of the, of, or the Persian native dynasty, we say the Mughals. So let me come to, so this is sort of the landscape of, of these three larger groups that have been fighting it out that we define as much and not much else that doesn't fit in. There's some smaller caste communities here and there that fit into the city, but this is really the defining structure. And in many ways, the story of the city's transformation is also the story about these Malaysia groups winning power and assuming power and taking power, taking possession of many of the institutions of the city and replicating in many ways the way in which the Maratha caste has institutionalized itself and won power throughout most of Maharashtra, especially Western Maharashtra. Now, um, so the, uh, apart from this uh, miscarried attempt to rename the city, what the next thing uh, the Sib Sena did was to decide to do nothing, that is, to do nothing <coughs> to preserve the agricultural or the uh, architectural heritage of the city. And there's been a systematic neglect. It's very visible when you come back after many years, you can see the kind of state of disrepair and everything. Uh, but they also did a lot of new things, especially down here in the southern part, southern, uh, in the new Arangabad, where they uh, uh, erected various big statues of, uh, of Sivaji, a huge equestrian statue of Sivaji that's uh, with stadium quality, 24 hours uh, uh, floodlights, uh, that they want to become, it's called Kranji Chow, the, 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 the uh, city that's there, or the, the space that um, uh, celebrates the struggle for what they see as the struggle for uh, control of uh, the city. Um, they had also started to erase uh, and raise to the ground a large area nearby, which was the old butcher's uh, uh, neighborhood in the city where uh, uh, the, the Muslim butchers had traditionally worked. They raised that to the ground. They had not been able to get the land passed on to, everybody, to anyone else because many Hindus believe, of course, that it's not good luck to live on land that has been had, had uh, Muslim abattoirs or Muslim houses for, for centuries. Uh, so now they're trying to pass it off to various multinational corporations or whatever without much luck. But as a kind of symbolic gesture, what they have done instead is to uh, set up a, um, they have erected a new shiny statue in the middle of this sort of, sort of overlooking this big empty plot of land in the, in the middle of the city uh, and, and put up a statue of Savarkar, the sort of the leader of the early leader of the Hindu Mahasabha, one of the sort of intellectual forces behind the whole idea of Hindutva, of, of, of Hindu majoritarian nationalism. 
uh, uh, almost like as a totemic force to to uh, ward off uh, whatever evil forces that might be left there. Um, but of course, that has not made much of a difference. They've also uh, uh, started to uh, build. There's been a huge number of new constructions completely away from the old city, surrounding the old city. The second largest shopping mall in India was opened there some years ago. And so then they've also started to take down many of the, um, uh, the uh, uh, old markets and public facilities in the city. Many of them actually have been you know, went back as far as to the 1600s, 1700s, uh, but on grounds of, of insanitary conditions. But much of it had to do with flushing out traders from the old city and instead forcing people to go to the newer uh, and mainly Hindu uh, trading areas. So this has been a big fight. And then in 2012, the city commissioner decided to dust off the old master plan. Let me just bring that up here. Uh, this is the same thing. Yeah. And that took place with uh, the deployment, or the large-scale deployment of uh, lots of, let me see where I can bring this. doesn't want to work. That's good. No, I can't bring it up. For some reason it doesn't work. Okay. So let me um, just continue and tell you the rest of the story. So, um, the, uh, the, uh, these are the only two pictures I have actually, so it's a, it's a bit of a bummer. Um, so this old master plan had been developed in the 1960s, was then dusted off, and was in, uh, then started to implement it in a systematic way. And what the uh, commissioner did in an unprecedented move was to basically um, take it take uh, uh, the, especially the parts of it that went through the old city and uh, demolished something like 2,000 houses in this, in the, uh, mainly in the Muslim areas uh, in the space of a few weeks uh, over two long spurts. Um, he brought out lots of uh, police, there was a heavy uh, mobilization of the press uh, and uh, they actually uh, destroyed a large number also of buildings that were protected by uh, various kind of architectural uh, codes and uh, uh, historical buildings. They brought down a part of the mosque, they brought down uh, several old madrasas, an old Muslim school, they brought down a, a 300 year old workshop that had been producing these very specific effigies and, and artwork for the Muharram festival, which takes year and place uh, every year, and so on. Um, and it, it, of course, produced a huge outcry among the Muslims in the city and everybody said, and I think quite obviously rightly so, that the way it was implemented was, had, was skewed so that it was mainly Muslim areas that were targeted. Now, the defense by the Muslim, by the commissioner was to say, well, this is just the, the master plan. And of course, the master plan was developed when the city was much smaller. And much of the areas that were targeted in any case were these older historical areas that they wanted, these young progressives of the 60s wanted to flush out in any case. What ended up happening, and I am sorry I cannot show it to you, um, it, uh, was that you had many of these streets that had been uh, as narrow as about 12 to 16 feet were all of a sudden. Uh, up to 24, 30 meters wide, so quite large, could have four lanes of traffic uh, and so on. But in them, there would be all these sort of little, uh, little darga standing, little temples standing, because they dare not touch those. And there would be houses sticking out in the middle of the road, where an influential person had been able to put a, a stay order in the high court to stop the demolition, or an influential family who had been able to 
um, that pull some strings with, with politicians and so on. So, it, it, so the master plan was implemented, but it was not implemented. Really. Uh, and after that, a long period of time ever since, there's been endless legal battles going on, uh, and very little has happened. There's been some uh, making of new roads, but in, uh, and very predictably, as I think is the case in many, many uh, 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 instances of large scale infrastructural uh, uh, renovation of reform, a lot of it gets brought down. Court cases. One of the interesting uh, uh, developments of this was that one of the strongest reactions came from an institution that many people had long forgotten about, which is called the Wack Board. Now, the Wack Board are boards that were set up during the colonial age to look after and administer all uh, property that could be said to belong to the Muslim community. Uh, it was a colonial uh, construction, and they continued into the post-colonial state, was seen as a sort of handy way of dealing with community property, that, uh, uh, and, and in a sense also putting the sort of quarrels over this land uh, under one heading within one particular uh, uh, sort of institutional form. The Wack Board became very sleepy, inactive uh, places, but they owned huge properties, especially in the former Nizami lands, because uh, the way you define a waqf is that it's any property that's been dedicated by a pious Muslim to be used for the benefit of the community. And it's actually up to the waqf board itself to determine, to determine which properties might qualify and meet these criteria. So, so, so it's a sort of lawyer's nightmare because it's a very uh, loose, imprecise, colonial kind of construction that was seemed to be good enough at the time when it was made, uh, but now in the, in the day of rising property prices and litigation and whatever, of course that whole uh, legislation that governs the rock board is open to all kinds of interpretation. And as you may have heard, rock boards were sort of suddenly electrified across India some years ago, in 2010, I believe, or nine, when the, the Uttar Pradesh Rock Board, with a new dynamic chairman, claimed that, in fact, none other than the Taj Mahal was uh, belonged to the Rock Board. Why? Because there is, inside the Taj Mahal, there is a functioning mosque, which is correct. Anyone who's been there can go, it's very small, and you have to look for it, but it's there. Now, that means that the whole property which is Taj Mahal can be defined for, uh, as falling within the Bakr statutes. This was what the board, within its powers, was enabled to it was enabled to rule in its own favor, yes, because this was a pious Muslim Akbar who had then devoted his, and, and so on and so forth, right? Um, so, uh, uh, so you could say that this is, this falls within the Wack Board. Of course, the Taj Mahal is a place of enormous revenue and interest and symbolic value, uh, but it's sort of people across India thought, well, if that's possible, then there are lots of things we can do. So, in retaliation against this sort of large scale demolition of houses in the Muslim parts of the town, what the Wack Board did was to uh, launch a whole series of, of, of uh, claims. It turns out that the Wack Board alone in the district of Aurangabad owns about 100,000 acres of land, most of it quite valuable. So it's a, it's a very massive uh, chunk of, of property. It turns out they found out that uh, much of this land had been leased by corrupt politicians to major companies um, that operated in this region at, at, at ridiculously low prices, something like uh, two rupees per square meter per year. Uh, of very valuable land on which major industrial properties were built. So they have now started to renegotiate these contracts, which were illegal in any case. And they also laid claim to the building upon which the uh, municipal corporation of, um, of Aurangabad was built, and the land itself. So this is also a market land because it was a building that was built by the Nizam of Hyderabad. In fact, every public building from the Nizami time is back there. 
Now this has been challenged in the High Court and go probably all the way to the Supreme Court, but this is something that both lots of other people across India are watching because if this is the case, then other cities such as Hyderabad and uh, Lucknow and so on, the, the, the prospects are quite sort of dizzy. You, know, you can think of what, what can uh, a VAC board actually do and what, what kind of, of countervailing force can it maybe be against some of these policies that are seen as encroaching on and destroying the Muslim legacy of India. Now, so this is, um, was one of the sort of, uh, you can say, surprising things that happened. Um, I'll wrap up in a moment. The last thing I want to uh, say, and I'm, this is where I also have a little bit of pictures, but um, is this to um, give you a sense of what does this in new landscape, this new um, economy then of the city look like? You can see that in the old city, around these conflicts, around urban development, around the uh, the uh, preservation of the city, very little has changed. You can say that the growth of the city has only put uh, higher uh, real estate prices and has not in any way uh, reduced the tensions along lines of community, but in fact, new right? Surely, our sociology textbooks will tell us in the realm of economy, this is where these things happen. This is the big this is the big transformer of society, it's the big transformer of um, also horizons of how people think of themselves. Now, when you look at the way in which the institutional and economic landscape of the city developed, the story looks a little bit different. The big, some of the big companies that came first were companies like Bajaj, uh, Videocon that makes uh, appliances, uh, Foster Beer, Skoda, and so on. Many people in the city, um, especially uh, young Dalits and young Muslims, uh, told me, and I was very surprised by this, but with a lot of vehemence, they said, we want more Skodas, we want more Foster Beer, we want more FDI, foreign direct investment. And I asked them, why is that? Because this is, these are the only places where we may, people like us may have a chance to ever get a job. You can really never get a job with these other Hindu companies. So I said, well, what do you mean by that? What's a Hindu company? What's a Hindu-owned company? Don't you know how they recruit and run their affairs? So one of them, <coughs> my new friends, and, and I got alerted to this, that the entire sort of tourist economy of Aurangabad, which is servicing all these people going to Ajanta and Nora, probably people that some of you have been serviced by as you were passing through the city, uh, are mostly Muslim. Many of them, um, quite well educated, uh, none of them without steady jobs, all of them self-employed, which is again, as you may know, a typical thing for Muslims in India. The, the latest figure that came out is that less than 7% of Muslims are actually integrated into anything we call a formal economy in India. The average for the country as a whole is somewhere between 22 and 25% uh, of the population. So it's a spectacularly low percentage. So, this is also true in Rangaba. They drive taxis, they run new travel agencies, they are guides, they run new uh, hostels, and so on. So they said, no, 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 this is how it is. This new Rangaba has nothing to do with us. And uh, a journalist friend of mine took me out to, to see the register of, of companies registered in Rangaba. There was one company out of 2,000 units owned by Muslims. Only one. Um, a small one. And another one that was owned by a Muslim who had then had a very hard time finding, uh, getting industrial land allocated in the city and actually had to move to a neighboring town where he had opened this, this, uh, this facility. So I said, so I asked him, what is this about? Is this about uh, open discrimination, or is it because they say they don't want people like you to say, no, 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 we, 
we never asked. There was no formal way of, of applying. We never, there were never jobs that I advertised. What about these big companies? Oh yes, Skoda, Fosters, the other uh, in multinationals, they're fine, they advertise the jobs, they take people in for, for tests and they take them in for, they do all these qualifying exams and recruitment drives and so on. So there we have a chance, but not with these other ones. And then they told me, and I heard this from various other groups, said, for them, and I will not say this is, I have 100% checked this, but for many of them, it was really the Bajaj company that had started all this. Bajaj company is the largest producer of auto rickshaws in India. In fact, they more or less invented the Bajaj scooter as a, as a concept, the, the rickshaw, the auto rickshaw, you have all seen. They have one of the largest production facilities uh, in Alangabad. And what they've done over time, in fact, in response to uh, labor union activity, is to begin a new model of industrialization, which then almost came to define maybe the way the city also grew and developed, which was to <coughs> outsource a system because it's a very simple thing to produce, and also which are apart from the engine. Everything else is very simple to produce. So they outsourced it to uh, skilled workers uh, that would then buy or lease some machines from the company, move it out to their village or some little workshop in the outskirts and open them, open uh, and produce these things as kind of subcontractors to the jobs itself. That also meant that they would recruit people from their own family, from their own caste community, and so on and so forth. And this became almost like a, a kind of method through which people began to develop um, um, workshops and industrial labor. So a, a, a good number of the 2,000 units are in fact smaller units that are subcontracting for the larger units in, in the city. And I have not systematically uh, investigated this in other parts of India, but I can look at work for, for instance, by Barbara Harris White, who works in South India, which has a very similar story of how employment patterns and also entrepreneurship happens within already existing communities. How uh, people borrow money from, from each other, they set up workshops, they set up factories, uh, they um, uh, pool resources in order to um, start uh, small economic units, and some of which uh, become big. And of course, when we look more deeply into this, there's a long history in uh, India of this, uh, where all the major unit, uh, Sort of economic uh, entities come, are based in very small communities, including the Bajaj that also comes from a, a, a trading uh, caste uh, uh, or a, a Banya community of, of very long standing. Uh, and other people, such as Ritu Bela, have documented this in, in more recent work. Historians have shown this. Dr. Haynes' new work on, on small town capitalism in India shows also how deep this is. And for me, it sort of just, in a sense, uh, was another piece of the puzzle why it was that I came back to this city after 25 years that was hailed now as a new industrial bonanza and found again and again and again that there was actually, that the city had not, it had grown, but it had not actually transformed. It had actually deepened many of the fundamental differences between communities had been deepened. Many of the fundamental patterns uh, had been just further entrenched. This also translates into, for instance, how um, institutions are built. There were, when I was in Aurangabad in the late 80s, there were about five or six major colleges in the city. By now, there's about 80, many of them private, many of them for profit, many of them fly by night operations, for say, not necessarily serious. There are also medical facilities as well. Many of them are owned by people from specific communities who, who, and, and who do admit people from across the board, but it's always the assumption that they give preference to people from their own communities. So Muslims would, whether they, it was true or not, would apply to the Rafiq Zakaria campus for admission. They wouldn't go to another college that was set up by another group that was a Hindu group and so on. So, and Dalits would apply to the Ambedkar universities to study and so on and so forth. So both in direct and indirect ways, um, not only the economic 
um, uh, life and the recruitment patterns, but also the institutional life of the city, uh, driven by this influx of capital, this enormous ability to build new institutions, to create new infrastructure, uh, to create new housing colonies, and so on, were directly or indirectly continues, in fact, to reinforce this fundamental, you can say, sociality of the three M's, the Muslims, the Mahal, and the Marathas, and now there are also many other groups that have come to work in, in the thriving economy in the Rome city, but there is nothing to suggest that this is something that is going to change uh, any of these long, deep patterns uh, that have been there for at least a couple of hundred years. Now, so let me wrap up here and say, what is it, what does it tell us about what I call vernacular urbanism? Well, I think it tells us a couple of things. One, I think it tells us that if we are to learn anything meaningful about what um, happens in Indian cities today, or South Asian cities, we should probably not look to London and Paris or uh, other such places um, to learn anything from, to predict what's happening. We may want to look at other, especially colonial cities that have grown, and one of the things, one of the fields of study I found very suggestive is some of the early urban sociology and urban anthropology done in the Copper Belt in the 1940s and 50s by a British social anthropologists, who at that time developed this whole thesis of what they call urban urbanism. Something that actually has been a bit forgotten but needs to, I think, be brushed off. So these are people like Glockman and, and Mitchell and people like that who are fundamentally arguing that what happens when you in a, what they call in the terminology of that time, or a traditional society or tribal society, move into the city, yes, you do become urban, it's a different horizon of life, but uh, it doesn't mean that your tribal or your ethnic identification goes away. Uh, what happens to it is that it transforms, it becomes simplified, it becomes more easily organized, and it becomes based on a set of easily identifiable markers. Uh, it becomes based on what Mitchell calls these kind of joking relationships between ethnic groups, or in some cases also more antagonistic, uh, even violent relationships. I think that speaks much more to what's going on in, in my story, or that's the story of many South Asian cities, than would a story that's akin to the industrialization of Manchester. What's going on in our country is not like Manchester, because it is a place that has a deep history. That deep history is not going away. In fact, it's just been used and used and reenacted again and again and again, uh, and, and, and reimagined. So that's one lesson. The other lesson that I would leave it at that is, I think, and I'm glad to see there's so much new work on the way, is I think we also may have to revise our ideas about what capitalism is and what capitalism does. That what the capitalism we see in a place like South Asia is not just a generic capitalism you would find in California or Sweden. There is no such thing. I think that's a theoretical mistake to make. What we see is a specific configuration of power forces of capitalism and accumulation, employment, uh, trust and so on, based on specific institutions. And there's nothing that suggests, it seems to me, that those have a great sort of uh, uh, telos built into them, a kind of homogenizing force that all makes them look more or less the same, although that's what business economists are telling us, this is what Marxist scholarship will often tell us. I think there is a, a lot to suggest that this is not the case, that what we're looking at here are specific forms of a, a dy dynamism, a specific kind of economy that develops in a way that, of course, is deeply embedded in its history and in character. So, thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. We can have a very informal discussion. Yes, yeah, it's a fascinating view that you have uh, given us about the. Um, the changes in our rank, but and the non-changes, and non-changes, yes.
the, the uh, preservation of, of the three hands. But my first question, very briefly, is there a demographic shift in terms of numbers from a Muslim uh, dominance demographically to a, a more Marathi dominance in, in numbers? In numbers. Yes, yeah, so the numbers are a little uh, difficult to uh, sometimes determine, but the, what I saw the latest, at least the latest census data, because they don't, uh, the data, the census data are all based on the district, the district as a mm. whole, not on the city itself. Mm. You don't have uh, specific data on, this is a problem, anyone who does uh, urban, counts urban phenomena in India is so left with, with these sort of more general data. So what you can see is over time is that, the, that because of the city's growth, everybody has become more, right? All communities have grown in absolute numbers. And in fact, you can say the growth rate has, of course, been strongest and highest among, you can call it Hindus uh, uh, of all kinds. Um, and you can even say that the single strongest growth has been among uh, non maharashtrian Hindus. That is, people who have come from outside the state to work in either in construction or work in um, industry, uh, typically at the more qualified level. There's been a very decided growth. Most of the sort of uh, simple jobs, the uh, non-specialized uh, jobs, have gone to uh, mainly Hindus from the city around there. And that has to do with the fact that many of them, uh, as is also well known from many other parts of South Asia, that one of the first things you do when you have become a successful corporator in the city in your second term is you open a construction company. You begin to build and you begin to convert your new political administrative access into being able to buy land, sell uh, buildings and get building permits because that's something that requires this absolutely detailed uh, being plugged. You have to be plugged in with the local bureaucracy to be able to work it. Um, not just for yourself, but for other people. You become a broker also of these um, permits and so on. So many of those, uh, of course, as is always the case in the growing city, one of the largest uh, growth sectors in, uh, or employment sectors has been construction. A lot of that has been local Hindus because they've been hired by these local chiefs and guys. So Muslims have reduced somewhat in proportionally from as far as I could gauge from earlier uh, census reports I've seen from the early 60s, late 50s, where it was around, so fluctuated between 70 and 80 percent of the city's population to be today, still at 35 percent, which is in numerical terms much more than they ever were before, but proportionally, of course, less. In terms of economic standing, there, there is the, the tiny Muslim elite that you have. Uh, has not grown that much, but actually there is a Muslim elite, there is a Muslim middle class as well, which I was surprised to find. But it's also clear that its wealth, its standing, it's not based on any kind of local resources. There is a, a big thriving private university campus which was started by a man called Rafiq Zakaria, who, who is more famous today as the father of a certain court, a man called Farid Zakaria, who runs one of the most popular most watched TV shows on American television. Uh, so they, that, that family's foundation has created a very large university, the incredibly well managed, one of the most beautiful campuses I've seen anywhere in India, uh, very sort of uh, high end. And many people work in that, but they come from outside, or uh, it, again, it's, it's almost like a uh, as some people described it to me as a closed economy. Right? It's a closed economy that uh, they get a good number of students also from Sudan, from uh, elsewhere, and uh, people are attracted uh, by the relatively economic, uh, or reasonable price of English language education in the city like Aurangabad. So that doesn't have necessarily a local base. There's also another source of wealth which has been for a long time Lots of people went, especially educated, uh, slightly educated uh, and skilled people went to the Gulf like they did from Bombay and worked in the Gulf. True from Hyderabad as well. 
Now that was an economy that worked pretty well in the 70s and 80s up to the first Gulf War, where lots of uh, the Emirates and the Saudis and so on preferred to have Muslim labor because they hadn't yet figured out how to handle labor from all over the world. Now they found out about that. So that sort of comparative advantage that Muslims, especially from the Deccan and from the south of India, had in the beginning has been lost. Now it's Bangladesh and Nepalese and Filipinos and so on that built everything. And Pakistan is too. So you do have some shifts, but it's very interesting that there is almost like a, a disembedding or almost like a deterritorialization of, of the Muslim economy. It's not no longer based on local sources as it as it used to be, except the tourist economy. Whereas the entire growth of the city, the industrial economy, uh, the infrastructure building, the construction boom, all of that is entirely embedded and it's very, very local, most of it. Um, the Dalits is a little difficult to, I haven't got very good data on that as yet, um, but it's one of the things I, I want to. Dalits in Iraq are a relatively religious people uh, uh, by comparison. It's also a big hub, has been for a long time, of a strong Dalit class. But again, not uh, a segment of the population that is doing particularly well in the in the private uh, the private sector. This is, I think, it's an overall problem in India that that industrial the industrial sector is simply not employing the people, and when they do, it's it's. Um, uh, the method in which employment takes place, the training of people about the lack of training, uh, the lack of good permanent jobs and so on is a huge problem. And this is, I think, what the Indian government realizes, but they, it doesn't quite know what to do with this because it seems to be one of the big promises of the Archid in the good days to come that Moody promised everybody, right? But without an industrial base, without India becoming a major hub for industrial production, how that is ever going to happen? And what I see just from one, this one little city is that industrial jobs are not necessarily, um, it's not the place of inclusion. It's not the place where new groups move through the system and sort of climb through the ranks. And so it's already, always already structured by the uh, forms of ownership, forms of preferred recruitment that these particular companies have. And why should we be uh, surprised by it? Because in every other aspect of life, caste community matters hugely in, in where you go to school, where you live, where you travel, who you marry, and why should it matter in terms of what job? So, that's a long answer to so. Thank you. Uh, let's broaden the canvas. Katarina. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, I have uh, two questions. Thank you a lot. Thanks a lot. I really enjoyed your, your lecture. Um, I mean, what I see what you're giving is a really good example of, I think, the governing, a governing process. I mean, of, I mean, of space, of um, subjectivity, yes. of um, mobility, even, I mean, when you talk about this space. So it's interesting about the kind of political implications of that. And, and especially as you were saying things, for instance, the example of the Dalits uh, and perhaps Muslims getting more access to um, international companies or yeah. I mean is, is this kind of then see is this playing into a kind of shift say in our Hindu nationalist narrative in the sense of also then promoting more home produced Swadeshi goods or that you know uh, being anti international companies is, is there any kind of stories that also plays into the larger politics within India at this time. So that was one of my kind of question comments. The other one was, I completely agree with you that I think we should compare mostly post-colonial cities with post-colonial cities. At the same time, I think there are so many parallels if we're thinking about Western cities and you know migration processes that have taken place, the growth in anti-Islam, anti-Muslim, especially looking at London, looking at the segregation of a city like London with all the kind of ghettoization as we talk about, which also is a way to reproduce, you know, traditional boundaries, ethnicity. So, so isn't there anything we can also kind of 
take from also the Western cities and actually make comparisons because I think there are more comparisons to be made, especially after 9-11 maybe, <laughs> you know, that could be made before. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, so those were my okay. two comments, those questions. Are, those are good questions. I, no, I mean, in, in terms of uh, the local, local, local commitment, I don't think, I mean, especially Chief Sena is not necessarily into this sort of uh, made in India campaign that see the yeah. Modi's new campaign, mm -hmm. which is one of the only original ideas that BJP ever came up with, which is actually not their idea because it's a very old nationalist mm -hmm. idea, right? It was actually coined by the Spadishi, yeah. original Spadishi mm -hmm. in Bengal in 1905. Anyway, uh, and buying, you know, India and so on. So Gandhi, the, there was already a, a deep stamp on that one. I don't know if that's going to take off at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it just shows there was a wonderful article recently about um, by Ramachandra Guha about uh, why India has no conservative intellectuals, which was a kind of uh, showing that you know the one thing BJP doesn't have it has numbers, it has muscle power, but it has no ideas. There's no respectable intellectuals that anyone wants to listen to. This is in the long run a huge problem for them. Anyway, and they have no economic ideas except this one. And I think it's completely out of sync with what a lot of younger people, also young Hindus, want. And certainly Sif Sena is not into this at all. I and mean, it's very interesting, different, right? I mean, Sif Sena is also the movement where when Michael Jackson comes to India the first time in 1998, you know, Bal Thakare, the leader of Sif Sena, invites him, to, invites him to his house and, you know, for drinks and whatever. You know, there's no way any BJP leader would ever do the same, right? I mean, so, so it's a whole different animal, in a sense, Sif Sena. See, that's not nationalist in that way. It's a Hindu community only kind of thing. But it's about us, our people getting access to the same goodies, right? So they love their Mercedes, they love their beer, they love, you know, all this kind of stuff. It's not a sort of ascetic um, uh, movement like the RSS or BJP. So I don't think that's what it is. I think it's about cornering the resources available. And what we talk about here is this particular economy, it's not just about building a new unit and it's also about harvesting the tax holidays that's available. It's about getting this heavily subsidized land. It's about getting all these permits which you can get through the government. So government is a big part of this, right? Of course lots of people will say, no, no, no government is a big problem in India. We cannot industrialize with this kind of uh, uh, level of interference. But as a matter of fact, there was no way that economy in Alangabad, that industrial economy, could have been thriving the way it has without local politicians who have done the planning, who have attracted these units to come, who have been very invested in, in doing this and, and developing the city without them having very deep and strong ties to, to the bureaucracy, not just in the region but at the state level. So I think actually it's less, that's less about India, non India, it's more about, about who has got access to the political resources and the minorities don't at all. So in fact, as many of my Muslim friends would say, you know, these people, they don't actually, they say they believe in the free market, but they don't. They break the market all the time. We people, we live in the free market because we have no protections, we have no political power, we are the ones who actually are the most there's something to that argument. Anyway, second question. I think I would like to reverse the order of things in your question. To say that when all the classics of urban studies were written, there was, of course, in especially the Chicago School of Sociology and the sort of uh, uh, urban ethnicity literature coming out of the US, there is that whole idea of you begin somewhere as a community, you accumulate, all the Sicilians stick together, they lend to one another, they move up through the ranks. But then, in the end, in all of this literature, you get integrated. Once you move to the suburbs, you make it, right? Then, in a sense, you, so the, the, the ethnic economy in the American story is always kind of ghetto economy, right? It works as long as you're moving through the ranks. Once you're into the general economy, the assumption is you've joined the whatever. Now, 
I don't think that is quite the case in the US at all. Um, I live in Silicon Valley and what we see there is a lot of ethnic networks working very, very effectively, raising money and so on. Also when they don't say what they are. Um, but I think it's a little different with, um, with what we see now. Because that kind of diversity you see in Western cities now, where there's so many different groupings coming, where politicians and planners and everybody have to learn to, de to deal with many different languages, many different requirements, many different this and that. That's in fact, you can say, the original condition of the colonial city. Right? So, um, what you, what's happening is most, maybe not so much that, that the same thing is what's happening in Bombay or Bombay is also happening in London. I would say what has been happening in Bombay and London for a really long time is now also happening in London. Mm -hmm. and, and this is true, I think, multiculturalism, and multicultural policies and all that. We talk about this in Europe and look into the way in which India was governed throughout the 19th and early 20th century. When you look into how many African cities were run, when you look at, into how Beirut was run and conceptualized from the very beginning and uh, during the French period, but also before and after, this, there's nothing new in it, right? Even the territorialization of communities. Um, there's a famous article by, uh, by uh, David Pocock from 1960. He worked on Benares. His argument was exactly, he said, only in an urban setting can the Hindu caste system fully develop. So he went against the grain that, you know, caste will disappear when you move into the city. Because only in the city can you actually systematically divide everything up in a way where you can actually avoid contact with other people or limit it to just the necessary contact in, in, in already laid out contact zones. Um, and I think there is something to that. Uh, it's not, I wouldn't quite uh, accept that full um, for the implication of it, but I think what's happening is that a lot of thinking about cities was done with, yes, race came into the picture in the American context and so on, and, uh, and, uh, but uh, as a whole, the whole idea of the transformatory force of the city it's all based on the idea that there is a mass society to be joined, right? that you give yourself over to other forces that will then shape, form who you are and how you imagine yourself to be, what association of life you will then join, and so on and so forth. All of which was completely true in ethnically relatively homogeneous countries. But that was never the case outside of Europe, literally. And I think we have to, in a sense, rejig that and, and rethink it and say, what is it that, hap that happens? So you can take my story and say, in the most sort of ungenerous spirit, or a very conservative spirit, and say, well, nothing will ever change. Look at this. You know, these Hindus and Muslims are fighting, and they will always do it, and caste will never go away, and you know, it's always the same. No, it's not the same. It's not the same. It's still the same names we give to it. There's some symbols that are transported over time, that reenactments of stories and myths and whatever. But it's not that the content is exactly the same. Right? But, but the divisions, the logic, the way the divisions are drawn, the desire to have boundaries, the desire to form and maintain communities for whatever purpose of self-defense, self-improvement, collective, this and that. Yes, they're there. But the, resources we bring to it. So homogeneity is, uh, <coughs> maybe just the rest of the world is, 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 Europe is catching up with the rest of the world, but the rest of the world is making Europe catch up with it. That's I agree. Yeah. Thank you. More questions? In uh, Malmö, yeah. right, we have a spectacular transformation in this direction. We had a, this from late 19th century to 1970. Malmo was the most important industrial city in Sweden. Yes. 
with a very strong labor movement and trade unions and, uh, and social democratic reformism in terms of agreements with the employers. And, and Malmö was absorbing immigrant, technically skilled labor from Poland, Germany, Russia, and Denmark, yeah. Yeah. and who, who were quickly integrated on the shop floor, in the trade union, in the neighborhood, the housing estates, and cultural associations, and so on. So there was not an issue of immigration for uh, 80 years in Malmö. But this industrial economy, this, the factories collapsed after 1970s, one by one. And now Malmö's economy is a high-tech or low-tech yep. service economy. Yep. Gentrification and uh, segregation. And the most unequal and poorest city in Sweden. Sure where all these forces that you have depicted for our Europa are at work. Yep. With segment seg segregated uh, workplaces, workshops, uh, living, associations, public spaces, etc. And it's a very subtle balance between order and disorder which you only discover if there is conflict about a particular resource, or if you as a person transgress a border yeah. and get caught in a situation where you shouldn't be sure. at all. Sure. So Malmö is an explosive city in a sense. More so than, of course, Lund, yeah. uh, or even Copenhagen. Yeah. But London may actually be on that brink of such a situation given the uh, uh, three out of eight million people in London are immigrants and live in segregated quarters to a large extent. So you, the world is divided into territories and, and of course businesses and so on. So, so it's true that we, we had a rather unique historical experience of factory society here in northwestern Europe. Yeah. which broke down a lot of social borders That's right. and integrated communities, made class careers the paramount thing. Yeah. Yeah. Education, te yeah. technical education, specialized employment, division right. of labor right. and right. integration. And uh, labor unions and, and, and political social democratic parties. And so on. But that era is somehow vain. But I find it very interesting to read. I mean, it, it comes out very strongly in some of this, you know, um, industrial sociology or the, the, the so sociology also from the colonial world, mm -hmm. for instance, the way in which sociologists at that time are describing this, what they see as a universal process that mm -hmm. would happen, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which shows, I think, that a lot of these things, um, uh, certainly or the, the sort of urban sociology of the time, it's not necessarily a descriptive thing. It's actually an ideological statement about how things should be. Right? Uh, and, uh, and, and you can see that very much working, especially the copper build. Mm. You know, you can see these are the, they're, they're coming in that direction. This mm. is what ought to happen. Mm. But, you know, there's historical work, for instance, coming out of Bombay. And Bombay was always in South Asia seen as well. That's at least the place where there's a proper working class. Okay. Big working class tenements, mixed working class from all over the subcontinent. But when you look into it, some work like uh, my uh, dear friend, now late uh, Raj Chandravarika, who did this fantastic work in, on, on mills and, and how labor was organized in the 20s, 30s, and 40s in Bombay. There he's documenting that caste, community, all these things were very much at work, not just on the shop floor in terms of who did what, where people didn't want to be close to the Dalits and, and so on and so forth but also in living quarters, who ate what, mm. uh, provisioning for, uh, for various kinds of tenements, um, 
their internal organization and how this was also linked to both hometowns, mm. where they came from, language, and so on and so forth. So, and interestingly, for instance, the first push, something I learned myself when I worked in Bombay, the first, I, I, I talked to a lot of people who had gone to work in the Gulf, and the, some of the first people to, uh, uh, from India to go as micro laborers to the Gulf were, in fact, Muslims in Bombay. Mm. Why? Because they had, many of them, uh, those who went were people with some technical education. Some of them were sons uh, of mill workers who had been laid off. Some of them were mill workers themselves. They were the early ones who were already in the late 60s and early 70s. There was this Muslim preference. But they also, and so I asked them, why are you laid off? They say, well, because um, we were, you know, Muslims were master weavers in the industry and so highly valued labor. But because they were also used to thread machines, and when they were threading the cotton thread, they would use their saliva and thread the machine. So people refused to work further down the line. They didn't want to touch the cloth that had been threaded by these guys. So they were laid off, and there was actually a demand from some of the more militant unions to when you have to lay off labor, why don't you begin with these guys? Then we get rid of this problem. So the Dalits and the Muslims, Muslims were the first to go, Dalits were the second to go. So what stayed behind was a kind of labor aristocracy of mainly local Malaysian speaking laborers who were, in any case, always the part of the labor. The so that doesn't fit well with the general kind of left narrative or Marxist narrative, but this is, you know, documentable fact. Mm. Uh, so I think it makes us, I mean, so it is a very European story. So, but it also raises the question of under what conditions can what mm. kinds of differences become important and unimportant, right? So, integration. And yeah. Distinction. What are the conditions under which this can actually be dealt with? Do you remember the novel by Mulcrach Arnold, Q? Yes, yes, of course. And the story when they strike work, and then there is a rumor amongst the workers about a Muslim raping a Hindu girl. Yeah. And it breaks down the whole strike. And it's a, one of the most fascinating yeah. sociological accounts of, uh, yeah. of how the system actually works. But then if you put on top of that, I mean, one thing is to have Muslims and Hindus mm. brought, in, brought into a, 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 an industrial space where you have everybody's from outside, everybody has come, mm. right? So it's a certain equality of condition. Everybody's paid the same mm. or whatever. Even there, you have these differences being played out. But when you then take a space like I'm talking talk about, where you know every square inch has a history, everybody knows exactly what happened there because blood has been spilled so often. You really remember, um, and you have this historical drama that's played out in the very same space. So of course, it stands to reason that those things are not just superseded. And even if you pull down the buildings. This is also what Modi and his ilk have tried to do in, uh, in Amrita. Mm. They were also raising a lot, a lot of Muslim architecture, whatever has been raised to the ground. And I think we have to get out of it, right? Yeah. Yep. It's time to um, wind up and yeah. say fantastic opportunity okay. for all of us. <laughs>